Hey, thanks for stopping in. My name's Thomas, and this, well, this is my family room, but it's also Zarb Audio Projects, at least for today. Well, this is the Digging Deeper video I promised you, in which we're going to take a closer, in-depth look at the bones and the construction and more details of this epic small cube subwoofer build. Now, I know it's pronounced epic. I'm just trying to, like, add a little flair to it, you know, like when people call Target Target. Anyway, it's the epic small cube subwoofer, and that's what I'm calling it, so that's what it is. So, I know you all want to get to this. You all want to know what's going on with this wobbling back and forth like an out-of-balance washing machine. But I'm going to go in order of the video just for continuity's sake. So, the first thing I need to talk about is the cabinet itself. I constructed the cabinet of half-inch material. It's a 10-inch by 10-inch cube made of uh, a glue-up that I did, as you saw in the video, of four layers of 1 8 inch high-density fiberboard. Now, why didn't I just use half-inch MDF? You could. If you're going to make this, just use half-inch MDF. You don't have to go through all this rigmarole. But I've used 8th, 1 8 inch hardboard, HDF, high-density fiberboard, many times in some of the curved uh, speaker builds that I've made. And I've found that it makes for a really sturdy and rigid panel, especially when you add a curve to it. And the, the reason I started using it was to create the curve because you, it's hard to get a curve unless you curve or make relief cuts in the back. So that's how I started using this, but it actually works pretty good for a, a straight flat panel as well. Now, so in, in order to explain why I, I did this, I need to sort of explain to you how they make MDF, medium density fiberboard. That's what pretty much everyone uses uh, to make speakers these days, including myself. Um, when they make it, they, uh, they, the, the sawdust or wood product and the resin glue, uh, they make a mixture of it and it's on a big um, roller and it comes down, it's pretty thick. What they do is they press it down to the exact thickness it needs to be and then it's uh, cured and then it's cut up and then shipped to the big box stores. But what happens is when you press something like that down, the out outer edges tend to be more dense than the inner, inner layer. So for example, with three quarter inch uh, MDF, when you drill it, say with a quarter inch bit, you'd never notice this. But if you use, say, a Falsner bit, say two inches or more, when you drill it in a drill press, you're going to notice that as you drill through the first layer of that MDF, it's very dense and hard to push through. It takes some effort. As you get into more of the middle areas, it's a lot easier to go through because the middle of, of an MDF panel is less dense than the, the, the surfaces and the faces. So that's true with thicker MDF and thinner MDF. It's more dense at the, at the uh, face of the board than it is in the middle. Um, so what you end up having is uh, thicker and more dense and less dense layers. So if you're using, uh, say, a high-density fiberboard like I use for this project of one sixth, uh, one eighth of an inch, you basically have the whole thing's dense, but it still bends well. So you end up with a denser panel if you use four layers of one eighth inch high-density fiberboard than if you just use half-inch MDF. Is it that big of a difference? No. I just wanted to do it to go the extra mile and show you that you could do it. Um, but you could use half-inch MDF if you wanted to make this just fine. Now, I would, if I were you, I would still use the miter cuts if you have a table saw or if you have an accurate hand saw or a circular saw where you could do it. Because that gives you um, more gluing area. Okay, you've got uh, half-inch, half-inch, gluing like this. Plus, you're going to get that seam telegraphing eventually, no matter what you do to it. But if you use miter joints, you actually have a more glue, uh, gluing area, more surface area when you glue it. So it's a smidge stronger. Not that it matters. It probably doesn't matter. But you're not going to get that, that telegraphing seam because you've got just this much where these two points meet of seam. And that never shows up when you veneer over. So that's really the main reason I did it. The next thing I mentioned in the video was the veneer. And I had never purchased veneer from AliExpress before. Uh, I usually get it from Joe Woodworkers, Veneer, Supplies.com. I've used Parts Express, and that's beautiful stuff. It's, uh, it's backed veneer. You can do a really nice job with that. So I've used backed veneer, unbacked veneer. The backing is usually a paper backing or like a phenolic backing, and it works really good with the uh, iron-on, glue-on method that I use. You apply the heat lock glue to the cabinet and to the back side of the veneer. You let it dry. You apply it and you use an iron to reactivate the glue and it works fine. I've never had a failure with that. But this, this said it was fleece backed. Now, like I said, I never ordered from AliExpress before and the first roll of veneer that I got was, they didn't even wrap it right. They wrapped a couple layers of craft paper around it. It came so broken and crunkled, I couldn't use it for anything. 
I sent them a picture, they sent me another one. It was a little different veneer. It wasn't exactly what I ordered the first time, but that's okay. It was pretty nice. But um, it was my first experience with fleece back veneer. And what I noticed, as you can see in the video, that after I got done trimming it, there was this fluff every place. I didn't know what that was about. I figured it had something to do with the fleece, but, you know, and even when I unrolled the veneer, I didn't know what side was the backing side and what side was the wood side. I actually had to cut a couple of test pieces off and do a test piece just to make sure that I was gluing this stuff on right because it's really not easy to tell. Now after I glued it to this board and applied a finish, um, this I applied the inside of the roll is facing out and this the outside of the roll is facing out. And I applied poly to both of these and lacquer to both of these just to get an idea just so I knew which side was facing out. Well, the um, inside of the roll is smooth. This is really rough. This is where the, the fleece backing is. But you almost can't tell by looking at it. It was really difficult. But at any rate, I had never used uh, fleece back veneer before. Would I ever use it again? Yeah, I would. Because you know what happened with that? Um, it, uh, it ended up being nice because it was very thin, first of all. I never used veneer that sliced that thin before. So that was good in and of itself. You've got to be careful sanding it, of course. But the other thing that was good about it was there was no line. If you look at the cabinet really closely, you can see that where one panel ends and the other starts, you really don't see a line there. And, and with paper-backed veneers, uh, phenolic-backed or wood-backed or whatever, you're going to see a little, a little line there. It's usually darker. And uh, it's not a big deal, but it's there. But with this, it's not there. So um, the fleece back in that respect was pretty good. Now, the reason I just applied the wood glue, like you see, to the cabinet and just stuck the veneer on top of it. The reason I did that was because I was afraid if I tried to apply heat to this uh, fleece back veneer, it was going to crack and stuff. I didn't know. I've never used it before. It ended up working good, um, but if you were to iron it on, I don't know if that fleece, I don't even know what it is. It looks like fluffy cotton or dandelion fluff. I didn't know if it had the ability to prevent the grains from kind of cracking uh, when you heat it up with the iron on method. See, what you do is when you use the iron-on method, you're applying glue to both. It sort of swells a little bit because the glue has moisture in it. When you apply it and you put the heat on it, you're actually drying it out a little faster, and it can have a tendency to crack. Unbacked wood veneers can do that fairly easily. So I didn't know what to expect with this, so I just put glue on the cabinet and I applied the veneer. Ended up working really good, and I should also speak while I'm talking about the veneer a minute on the process that I used. Probably some of you are wondering, why didn't you just put the veneer on and then put a board on and clamp it? Well, you could probably do that and get away with it, but as I said, I wasn't familiar with the veneer, so I put a layer of wax paper, and that would prevent the veneer from sticking to whatever clamping method I used. That would be a big mess if it bled through and stuck. But then after the wax paper, I used an eighth-inch piece of the hardboard, just a little bit bigger than the cabinet, and then I used a quarter-inch piece of cork. And the reason I did it that way is because the hardboard is going to provide something rigid to sort of press on that veneer, the cork is going to be able to even out any like irregularities because sometimes your cabinets aren't perfectly flat. And also sometimes when you put that three-quarter inch piece on top to actually clamp against, that doesn't always provide 100% equal pressure along, um, along the surface. I've never really had a problem with it, but I've done this a few times. I think it's kind of like a safeguard method just to make sure that you have enough pressure every place. It's probably overkill, but... I do it for that reason, just to let you know why I did it that way. If you just wanted to use um, a board and clamp it, you probably would be fine. But this, to me, is just a smidge safer. So the next thing to talk about is the driver itself. Um, as you saw in the video, it has a pretty thick flange. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. It's a cast aluminum basket. It's beautiful. Um, the gasket on it is, I would say, a good eighth of an inch, and it's pretty dense foam. I'm used to Dayton, uh, uh, you know, having including gaskets on their drivers because they do that little extra mile thing. But this was pretty thick, and as I placed it in the in the box after I cut the recess in the opening, I couldn't with my hands actually compress that gasket enough uh, to make the driver set flush like it would if it was actually mounted. And keep in mind, you have four screws only to to compress that gasket and to to seat the driver. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons also why I added that extra disc of material around to provide for some extra material for the screws to bite into. The box is only made of half-inch material. If I were to take that half-inch 
and take a quarter of an inch out of it to, to create the recess, I'd have a quarter of an inch of material for those four screws to bite into. And I don't think there's any way that, that would be strong enough, unless it was made of oak or something or maple, to actually push that driver down uh, far enough to, to seat it because that much thick gasket material was really hard to compress. I had to, uh, I, you could feel that it took some effort to get that snug. Um, but that extra bit of material gave me a little bit over half of an inch of material for each one of those four screws to go into and bite into. When I, I did draw a pilot hole for each, as you saw in the video, and I went a little small on the size, so it was pretty snug, just to make sure that I had really good holding power. And I did, I didn't, don't think I showed you in the video, but I did squirt just a little bit of super glue in each hole to kind of harden those fibers up. And that's something I'll often do with MDF because it's, MDF is glorified cardboard, you know, and high density fiberboard's a little better, but it's not a whole lot better. So that was the story behind that. While I'm talking about the driver, uh, I showed you the harness that I made up real quick, but I didn't mention the details about it. Um, basically, this driver is two forearm coils, right? So you've got a forearm coil, a forearm coil, and if you were to just connect the positives and negatives, that would be a two ohm load to an amplifier. Well, most home amplifiers, home subwoofer amplifiers, are not going to like that. So. You could use just one coil at four ohms, but then it would change the specs and you would need a, a larger box probably, things would change. So it was, the specs were given for two uh, four ohm coils uh, run in series. So basically you take the positive lead of one coil, the negative lead of the other coil, run those to the amplifier, and the two leftover leads you just hook together basically. So that's, that's called series wiring. And that presents an eight ohm mode to the amplifier. Now, this, this uh, driver is a, not an efficient driver. It needs a few watts to get going. So you need a half decent amplifier to, to push it to its uh, capable output. But that's the way I did it. That's the way I wired it. And what I did with the wiring harness is I got some uh, polyfill type material that's, that's, that's flat. It's sort of a material that sort of holds together. I sprayed a little contact cement on it and I sort of wrapped the wires with it just in case inside the box things would start to rattle around and jiggle and make some noise which you don't want. I did end up putting a little piece of duct tape after I got it in there and sort of taped it to the bottom so it would have less to move but I thought that was a maybe a little extra step that I would do just to make sure nothing rattled around because it it gets kind of violent inside that box. <laughs> Alright so let's talk about the feet. Um, and this is something that uh, I really am excited about because uh, myself for audio componentry, like in the house, I've always loved the look of brushed aluminum. I mean, I think that's just the sexiest, nicest looking stuff you can make an audio component out of. That's just my opinion, I know, but that's how I feel. And uh, we recently purchased a car, it's a Nissan Rogue, and in the inside, it had uh, some pretty cool texturing on a few of the panels, the armrest panel and the center console panel. And I just, that just blew my mind that that was so nice. It's got a good feel to it, it has a really nice look to it. The light as it moves kind of looks a little different as the light moves and it's just interesting looking as a texture. And I thought uh, when I was trying to figure out what kind of feet to put on this, because I did want to lift it off the, the, the floor just a little bit, I thought of uh, some different things and I said, well, let me just use some PVC pipe. So uh, I did end up uh, using two inch interdimension inter uh, PVC pipe for this. And rather than just go with the standard black and clear coating, I said, let me try to get that texture technique uh, on the, the, uh, on the, the uh, pipe. It's ABS, uh, black, black plastic pipe. And so what I ended up doing was I started to think about it, and probably I thought the best way would just be to use the, the belt sander. So that's what I did. I rested the uh, tube on the, uh, the ledge there, and I just rolled it by hand. I moved it slowly. So it basically cut out grooves of varying thickness and depth due to the varying uh, coarseness of the sandpaper. I think it was like 60 or 80 grits, pretty coarse uh, sandpaper in that uh, belt sander. Now, if I had just turned it on and tried to do it real quick, it would have just made flat spots and made a mess of it. But doing it by hand like this enabled me to, to uh, give just the right amount of texturing, remove just the right amount of material, and it really ended up looking nice. I'm very, very happy with that. And so, you know, it's at the bottom and you can't really see it. In fact, that's one of the things I wish I had done a little differently was maybe made the feet just a little bit taller and move them out towards the outside just a little bit so you could see them a little bit more because they're kind of a neat feature and they're sort of hidden. When I tested this out, I tested it out on the workbench and I could see more of the feet and I said, ah, it looks about right. But I realized 
when you put it on the ground, you're at a different angle and you can't see the feet as much. But I do really like this technique of, um, of using the uh, textured plastic. So what I did was I just went over it and made sure that there was texture every place. And uh, basically the little sand fibers, the grip fibers, they, they're little knives and they cut a little strip, a little, uh, um, a little piece of the plastic out, um, kind of like a wood, you know, a wood fiber you'd cut out if you were using a shaver, a spoke shave or something like that, or a scraper. And that had to be sort of sanded off just so you could get rid of those hairs. And uh, I just used some fine sandpaper for that. But it still kept all the texture. And then I just shot it with some clear, uh, some clear coat. And it ended up looking really nice. The clear coat kind of gives, gives it a shine. And as you move around at different angles, you can see uh, the light sort of reflects off of some parts of it and other parts it doesn't. So to me, that's beautiful. I really like how that came out. And I definitely intend to use this, this technique on other things that I make from here on in. So anyway, that was the story behind that. And of course, now I didn't have a Faulkner bit to actually make these fit perfectly. I wanted them just a touch snug. So what I did was I ended up getting a 60 millimeter Faulkner bit special for this. And um, that's actually two and three eighths if I'm not mistaken. I'll correct it on the screen if I'm wrong. But that wasn't quite big, big enough of an opening for this to fit into. So I had to make this tool out of a smaller piece of ABS. I, I used some contact spray to uh, adhere a piece of belt sander material to the uh, plastic tube. Uh, you know, belt sander material is very thick and durable and it's made to last. It's tougher than just regular sandpaper. So I glued that to the tube and I was able to just sand around a little bit and open that up just a bit and get flat to the bottom so that I could tap in this, these uh, completed feet with a little epoxy, just tap them in and it's plenty strong enough. You know, as you can see, I can sit on it. And it has plenty of strength. There's no issue with that. Um, so it ended up working pretty good. But that, like I said, that is a technique that I really like. And I'm definitely going to use that in the future because that's something I haven't seen anybody do that. I'm not saying nobody has. I don't think I'm the first to try that. But something I tried that I really liked how it came out. Well, let's talk about the passive radiators, okay? Um, I know you were watching the video when you got to this part here. You were probably as amazed and astounded as I was. I was not expecting to see that. Why is this box rocking back and forth like an out of balance washing machine? <laughs> you know, uh, it didn't happen until I turned it up almost to the to the maximum amount of excursion that, that this driver and passive radiator had. So that told me something, but I really didn't know what was going on. I had never seen that before. Now, the reason I used passive radiators just to get into the design a little bit is because this driver is an amazing driver. It's able to play loud and low in a very small box. But if you vent it, you're going to need to put a vent in it so big that the box is no longer small. You're going to be at a pretty decent size because it needs, I would say, at least probably a two and a half inch inner diameter uh, vent. And it's probably going to be in the 20 to 30 inch length. Now, if you do a slot vent, you're still going to need to take up a considerable amount of the box. And then you've kind of negated the coolness of being able to use such a small driver and keep the box small. So I went with passive radiators. Uh, I ended up going with these Dayton uh, Audio um, Designer Series Paper Cone 8-inch passive radiators. And like you saw in the video, and this one here is, is one of the ones that is the one that went berserk <laughs> that caused it to go so out of balance. I ended up cutting the frame open. Um, and the reason I did that was to be able to mount a larger washer inside. Now I've got you know, different size washers that I've purchased, um, but the ones that fit inside the stock opening were smaller, and in order to fit enough of those on there, I had to, I had to really go out with the stack of washers. And what that ends up doing is it ends up creating a lever effect where it wants to tilt the cone cockeyed. You don't want that. You would optimally, you'd like the weights to all be as close to that spider in there as possible so that it doesn't want to rock this way or this way. It, it's just sort of even in there. Um, so that's why I cut this out, to fit larger washers inside. I ended up picking these up at the hardware store. They're just smaller than the opening that was there stock, but you, you couldn't actually do it that way. It was too close, so I had to open it up more. So I could use less of these and to keep the weight closer to the center of where the spider is. But I ended up going with 120 grams, which was what my original design was for. That would um, give me an F3 in the mid-30s. As you can see here, the F3 is about 37 hertz or so. That's with the original 120 grams of weight. 
and that was originally what I thought was going to work for this. Parts Express doesn't really give you maximum amount of weights in the literature that you can add to the passive radiators. Maybe some of them they do, but this one I didn't see it. So I thought 120 grams would be okay, but apparently, apparently it may have been a little bit too much because uh, uh, as this uh, passive radiator reached the limits of its excursion, it started to do something funny, as you can see. And it was making noise. Um, this was the one that was making noise. I pulled it out. I immediately ordered another one, and that one has performed fine. Of course, I didn't add 120 grams. I only added 100 grams. As I redesigned it, I had discovered that the F3, from being, I think, 36 hertz or so, it moved up to 39 hertz if I moved the weight from 120 grams per passive radiator down to 100 grams. And that, of course, made life a lot easier for in a lot of ways because, A, anyone that makes this doesn't have to cut an opening in this. They can use the stock opening just like it is. And you can use enough of the smaller washers so that the stock bolt will actually work. You can get uh, almost a quarter of an inch inserted and everything will be fine that way. So that makes life a lot easier. You're giving up a very minimal amount of performance, uh, base extension, additional base extension. And it's basically the best way to do it. So I'm happy with that and it works fine. But, you know, I did cut this out and I thought maybe... Uh, maybe the glue joint got too hot and it weakened or something, but no, I felt I felt in there and, and there's no way in the world that this got hot enough to affect that glue joint because it's far inside. So I'm not sure what happened or what was causing the rocking. I have two theories. One, one is that, I, and this is not what I think happened, I think I just worked it too hard, over-excursed it, over-excursioned it. I pushed it too far and I worked something up, basically. Um, I don't think that's what happened because I can press this all the way to its limits. I don't hear anything. Everything seems like it's functioning properly. And when I say I'm pushing it to its limits, it's as far as it's going to go. I don't hear anything lifting or making any noise. Of course, you might not hear that unless it was really rattling in the box. But now the other clue that tells me that my second theory is the real one that was causing the problem is that uh, once I turn the volume down, it stopped making the noise. So this is what I think happened. This is what I think is causing the cabinet to rock. Um, what I think is happening is, is each passive radiator is designed and built, constructed to a tolerance. And I think what happened is one of the passive radiators, they were both close to bottoming out, but I think one of them, this one, was made a slightly different tolerance so that when it, when it maxed out, maybe because of the glue joints or maybe because of the slight differences in the spider surround, this one was reaching its limit a little bit sooner than the other passive radiator. And what I mean by that is, as the passive radiators moved out or in, one of them was reaching its limit a little sooner than the other one. So this, this weight, you think of it as a weight slug, this weight slug was going and then stopping, this one was moving a little bit more. So that could create an imbalance that would cause the cabinet to rock like that. And that's sort of supported maybe by the fact that it only happened at lower frequencies where the excursion of the passive radiator was really at its maximum. And when I turned it down a little bit, it basically stopped. So I think, like I said, it had to do with this passive radiator reaching the, the limits of its mechanical excursion, either on the outward or inward stroke, and it being a little bit nonlinear uh, in relation to the other passive radiator. Now, the other thing you might think, well, Zarbo, maybe you just screwed up the weight. Maybe one weighs a little bit more than the other, and when it got to the extremes, it was causing that problem. That's possible. Um, however, I looked back at the video, and when I looked at the amount of weight that I added to each passive radiator, it was exactly the same to the tenth of a gram. It was 120, so what do we have here? 125, that's fine. We got three of the big washers, two of the smaller washers, and I'll, I'll just double check on the other side. So 125, can't read. So I think that's probably not it. I think. Uh, I think it's probably the fact that it was one was maxing out before the other, and that was causing it. Because when I turned it down, uh, the problem went away. So the um, so like I said, the difference in output between going with 120 grams of added mass per passive radiator and going down to 100 grams is very minimal. As you can see from the graph, the purple line shows the output of the 120 grams on the passives, and the yellow line shows the 100 grams. And that might look like a lot, but keep in mind they're only the, the horizontal lines are one decibel uh, gradients there. 
So it's really not that much. You get a little bit of a boost there with the uh, 100 grams. But again, that's only one decibel. It's not even audible. It's, it's micro of a difference, and it really is hardly a difference at all. Now, there is a one, two, three hertz uh, less uh, higher of an F3 with the 100 grams than with the 120 grams. And that's, it's a difference. And you can see it on a graph. And these are, these are actually um, simulations. I didn't, this is not the actual output, of course, but these are sims, but they're going to be pretty close. But um, the difference between the one and the other is minimal. You're probably going to see more of a difference if you move the subwoofer a foot one way or the other, you know, if you're near a wall or in a corner of a room. So to me, that's a totally fine trade-off if it keeps the passive radiator from wrecking itself. And here you can see the, uh, the actual measured uh, tuning of the box here that I did with the DATS after the box was completed. And this is with 100 grams of weight added to each passive radiator. You can see that the final box tuning, uh, which is the null, the center of the null between these two peaks, is, um, is about 41 hertz. And that's about what you would expect from looking for an F3 of uh, you know, 36, 37 hertz, somewhere around there. So probably the F3 of this cabinet is going to be somewhere in the just under 40 hertz range, and that's, uh, that sort of bears itself out in what I'm hearing as I'm listening to it and playing test tones and music through it. So with every project uh, that I make, and usually most people make, there's usually one or two things that you would say, I would do this different. Well, with this, there really isn't. Um, I already mentioned the feet. I kind of, if I was going to do it again, I would move the feet a little closer to the outside just so you could see them more because I think they're, they're very attractive, and it's sort of a design feature now because it looks so cool. Because they're in a little bit, uh, they're not quite as visible, so I'd move them out a smidge. Um, the reason I didn't was because I knew I'd be tapping them in a little bit, and I didn't want to like break the wood and have it crack and everything, but in reality, it didn't take much of a tap to get it in there, and you could sand it out a little bit bigger, and so you wouldn't even need to tap it in. The epoxy would keep it in by itself. But I would definitely go out maybe another quarter of an inch so the feet would be a little bit more visible, maybe even add maybe a quarter of an inch or so of extension of length to the to the tube so you could see them a little bit more. So I guess the next thing to talk about would be um, should you consider building this? If you're uh, if you're looking to build a, a smallish subwoofer box, something pretty small, I would say this should be pretty high on your list. Um, there are a couple of other ones that I could think of that would be sort of in the same range, but this particular driver is pretty extreme. Like I said, it has about 14 millimeters of Kipple verified uh, excursion uh, under basically under full magnetic control or nearly full magnetic control the distortion is really low and it's capable of more excursion than that I've kept cranking this thing higher and higher and higher with some pretty low bass stuff and it's been performing very well it performs like a much larger driver but you got to consider everything when you're considering uh, whether or not you want to build a project so um, the driver's $100 each passive radiator is 25 so you're looking at 150 bucks for the moving parts of this and that's not inexpensive. If you just want to get, have a smaller kind of cube and you want to get some decent bass, I would say probably the best way to do that is just to get a, a good 8 inch or 10 inch subwoofer and vent it. Now you're going to have a larger cabinet, it's going to be a cubic foot, maybe a little bit bigger, um, but that would be a cheaper way of doing it. 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch cube, I don't know of any other subwoofer that gets that loud and that low, that clean and that size of a box. So someone, a couple people asked me, you know, what's the deal with the small subwoofers are? But why, you know, why don't you go with something bigger? Why does it have to be so small? And I admit, part of it is the novelty. There's something cool about watching a Chihuahua. They can bite and mangle <laughs> as good as a Great Dane can. You know. It's just there's a novelty aspect of it but for me the real thing of using this driver is that you can get it in a small box and I had to use passive radiators that adds to the cost but it, it doesn't really matter too much to me at this point if, if you're gonna make one or two projects a year or one project every couple of years add in another fifty dollars for passive radiators it's not that big of a deal you know for me in the, in the grand scheme of things so anyway uh, let me show you some video of this uh, subwoofer playing in my family room. Now this is not a small family room. Uh, this is probably 14, 15 feet or so by, it goes, it opens up all the way back to the, uh, into the kitchen, which is probably a good 30, 35 feet. So I'll play some music through it and then we'll wrap up.
know, it's hard not to be impressed with something that small making that much of a racket and filling a room this big with a nice, fairly distortion-free sound. Um, I've been listening to it for a few weeks, like I said, and it's, I'm just amazed. You can crank it up louder and louder, and like I said in the first video, usually when you get a small subwoofer past a certain point, it just doesn't get any louder. It just starts sounding worse and worse, and it sounds strained. This doesn't do that until a fairly high level of volume. So I really like this. This is one of my favorite projects I've ever done, and um, I'm really happy with it. But this has gone on a little too long already, so I just want to say thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. What? <laughs>